I heard banging on the door, and at that exact same time, this figure with some deformities in his face and huge eyes was standing over me. I could just almost feel the hatred coming off of it. I stopped, and I look over in the corner, and there's this girl. She's huddled up. And I said, hey, nothing. And I said, hey, again, louder. And the girl brought her head up and looked right at me. And I've never been so scared in my whole entire life. And I screamed as loud as I could. The trailer that I lived in, it was uh, your normal average size mobile home. And it was put into a little lot on Nicole Road in East St. John, New Brunswick. I told my mother right from, right from the beginning, from the second month that we lived in the trailer, I told her weird things happened. I heard whispering. And they took me to a child psychologist, and then another child psychologist. And it was apparently figments of my imagination, or some said lucid dreaming. Um, the doctors and my parents come up with various reasons, just none of those reasons were accurate. Not being believed can be one of life's most frustrating occurrences. But what if you're a child, your experience terrifying, and it's your parents who are doubting you? Hello, I'm Lawrence Chow. Today on Ghostly Encounters, we meet Donna and Andrew. Both remember seeing ghosts as children, and they both remember how it felt when their parents didn't believe them. A childhood home should hold many happy memories, but for Donna Marshall, hers are being stalked by a deformed ghost. I would say probably about a month, I would be able to hear whispering in the hallway. And I could never decipher if it was man, woman, a child. It was just jumbled talking all the time. And I couldn't understand how everybody could sleep so deeply or ignore it because I was just absolutely positive there was something there. times I just stayed awake in my room and I did bring it up to my mother and father. I often would make that trek down the dark hall to my mother to get her to come and sleep with me and it affected me. It made my parents fight because here every night she had to come sleep with her child. I felt bad, and a lot of the times, it made me not go wake her up, and me just sit in my room waiting for morning to come. A lot of the times, going through this, instead of going and getting my mother at the other end of the trailer and bringing her to my room, I would sleep on the couch in the front room, which was the next room to her. I remember laying on the couch and you would just randomly open your eyes and you would see the rocking chair rocking. And 
I would tell my parents that, and uh, they didn't believe me. I don't know why they didn't believe me. They didn't see it. It didn't bother them. So therefore, it was just an overactive imagination. A little while after that, I was laying there in my bed. I hadn't gone to sleep. And I could still hear things in the hallway. I looked out, and there was nothing there making the sound. And I just knew, should I go get my mother, like I have many, many times before? And um, sometimes, most times, it was worth the risk. So this night, I went up the hallway, and I had to pass the bathroom on my right to get to my mother's room. And there was a figure in the mirror, but I could only see a smoky shadow. So I couldn't see anything clearly, but it was saying, don't turn the lights on, just come here for a minute. was nothing there making the sound. And I was saying, no, I'm going to get my mom, and it got, come here now. I was frightened. I was, I was terrified. I didn't want to stay there, and I took off. I went right down to mom's, and I told her, and of course, like you would say to any kid, there's nothing in the mirror, there's nothing. And I believe I slept on the floor on a blanket beside her bed that night. So I would, after that, make sure that the bathroom door was closed before I would even go to sleep that night. And when I was going to bed, it was a ritual. I would cover usually my window and my little mirror on my dresser. I would put my little grade five red Bible and my medallion underneath of my pillow. I believe it's called a St. Benedict medallion, and it has a Latin prayer on the back that is supposed to keep away evil spirits. No one had to tell me that they would help. I knew that that was the only form of protection I had. and. The dolls, I just turned them all upside down because I felt like they were watching me. It was their eyes, their constant watching eyes. Some of them I would stuff down far into the toy box. I remember some of the ones that looked maybe a little scarier than the one beside it used to get tucked real far down into the toy box. It was so hard. I, it was the hardest time that I've, to not be believed and to be tortured and not be believed. You know, when people say, oh, it was a dream, you know the difference between a dream or not. And then once you actually see something, that about does it for you. That's when you know you want to get out of there. One time, I did have my mother sleeping with me, and she was on the inside by the bed, and I was on the outside. And I heard banging on the door, and voices chanting, let us in. Now, whether it was to get into my home, or into my soul, or into my life, I don't know. exact same time, this figure with some deformities in his face and huge eyes standing over me. I could just almost feel the hatred coming off of it. And I remember looking over towards my mom and shaking her, and she didn't wake up. And I looked back, and it was still standing there. She was right there, and so was it and I knew that there was no protecting me then. And it just went away. The voices, the fear.
figure went away. You know, it, it's actually hard to, to talk about about something so bad that happened as many years ago as it was. What I lived through was terror. We finally moved out of there, finally, and that heavy feeling was all gone and, and everything in here felt light. And it was so nice to just just sleep. And I slept and nothing hurt me. Nothing even tried to hurt me. And that's when living for me began. When Donna moved to a new home, the ghost stopped appearing. But when Andrew McVicker changes houses, he has a very different experience. For it's under the new roof that his terror begins. I remember we had, we had lived in smaller homes before. Uh, we had mini homes up until then. And then we, mom and dad wanted to buy this. They found this house. It was a really good deal. It was big. It was out in the country. There was no neighbors. We had a big yard, a road. There was a river down the road so that we could go swimming. So everything was all good, like it was the ideal place to live. And uh, I remember moving in and getting my own room. And that made me the happiest I had ever been up until that time. It was shortly after I moved in that I'd start hearing things. sounded like doors opening, doors closing. There was footsteps, two to three maximum, because it really wasn't, you wouldn't really have to take more than two or three steps to get anywhere in the upstairs. My parents' bedroom was downstairs, and my sister wasn't old enough to walk. When I heard these things, I'd lay in bed with my eyes wide open, scared, my heart beating fast. I could really hear my heart over anything else. Like, I'd lay there, and I'd just hear my heart just thumping in my chest, and I didn't know what to do. My parents would hear it, and they'd think that my brother and I were uh, awake running around upstairs. We'd get in trouble the next day for... Uh, not or for being up all night and uh we're saying no we're not i know we're not eventually they they sent uh they sent me to a psychiatrist and in turn the psychiatrist said that uh, i was a sleepwalker so that kind of eased their mind on what the noises were upstairs of the house it bothered me that my parents didn't believe that it that it was it wasn't me like i knew it wasn't me like, I really did. I knew for sure it was me because I'm sitting there and I, I know what I'm doing. And I, they say you don't remember if you're a sleepwalker, but I was hearing the same noises that they would hear. And I was awake. I stayed over at a friend's house one night and uh, he slept with a fan on him. It was during the summer, so yeah, you needed a fan if you didn't have an air conditioner uh, just to keep you cool as you slept. And I had an amazing sleep. And uh, I said, well, maybe I'll try doing something like that. So I convinced my mom to get me uh, a table fan. And so I slept with that on, and I was able to sleep at night. For a little while, at least. My bed was up against the wall. So I was laying there, and uh, I had my fan on. And it was, I'd say it was probably around 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was awakened by something. So I felt somebody sit down in the blanket, kind of physically pulled me. I could feel it pulling on my body. I was the only one in the room. So why is my blanket being pulled? And I thought at first, I said, oh, maybe it's just the way that I moved. It felt like my blanket was pulling me but I could feel somebody sitting down. My heart began to beat really fast. I got really scared, and uh, I looked, and there was nobody. 
Now I was wide awake. Like I, there was no getting back to sleep after experiencing something like that. Things were going through my head, like, what could this be? Who could it be? Is there somebody in my room? Like, I'm really scared now. I get up, and I kind of checked out my room and looked all around. I looked in the closet, and there was nobody there. And I looked around, and it was a, it's a fairly big room, um, and there was nobody. So I said, OK. So I opened the door, and I, uh, I walked down the stairs. The stairs were really steep. And, the house was fair, fairly lit up, like it might have been the moonlight. It was almost like there was lights on. So I walked across the floor, and, like it was, it was a farmhouse, so the floor squeaks. corner and there's this girl she's huddled up first I said Aileen what are you doing Aileen's my sister and I realized there's no way she could be out of her bed I mean she's five or six years old at the time and I'm looking at her and she's wearing like a white nightgown with like a blue bluish pattern like she was that close that I could see her and I said hey and then I said hey again louder and the girl brought her head up and looked right at me and i've never been so scared in my whole entire life and i screamed as loud as i could she was a girl in my house anywhere between 18 and 25 years old and her hair was wet she looked cold very pale i remember the expression uh, that's something that sticks in my mind it was just blank like there was no happiness there was no sadness it was just blank but it wasn't like she was looking at me. It was almost like she was looking right through me. My parents came out of their bedroom. I woke them up out of a dead sleep. And they, I was, scre I was losing it, literally losing it. And they brought me down on the floor and held me there until I stopped crying and screaming. Asking me what happened. There's a girl in the house. My dad searched the house. And there was nobody in the house. He searched the basement. He searched the attic. My dad had never been in the attic of his house that he bought, and he went up in the attic that night just to check, just to satisfy that there was nobody in the house but the people that were supposed to be in the house. So now, my parents think there's something wrong with me. They said I was half awake, half asleep, that I was sleepwalking and I saw her. I was wide awake. I knew what I saw wasn't a figment of my imagination. And all that kept going through my mind was, who is this in my house? Why is she here? And why am I seeing her? When I first saw her, she was she was solid. That's why I thought there was somebody in the house. I knew what I saw it wasn't a figment of my imagination. I said to my dad, I said, she's in here, she's in here. No, there's nobody here. You're dreaming. But I was wide awake. So now, my parents think there's something wrong with me. My parents sent me back to the psychiatrist to see what was wrong with me. That all came back negative. I never, there was nothing wrong with me mentally. Then they just played it off to an adolescent growing up, uh, causing a stir, trying to get attention. But if I wanted to get attention, I would have done something stupid, not screamed and woke my parents up in the middle of the night saying I saw a ghost. I, I tried for a year to try to convince them that I saw something. And uh, after I couldn't convince them, I just let it go. I've asked around different stories, trying to figure out who this girl might have been. And uh, we lived on the side of a hill, and there was a marsh on each side. And uh, I had heard some, of some people maybe getting lost in the marsh. So this girl's hair was wet. She had definitely been in water. Maybe she's still out there. Maybe the, the, she was never found. And maybe she just finally wanted to rest, and she wanted one last person to see her because nobody saw her before she went missing. I never saw her after that. So maybe she just wanted somebody to know she was there. I don't really know. 
Neither Andrew nor Donna's parents believe them. Our experts tell us this is what usually happens in Western societies where our science-based worldview has no place for ghosts. Aboriginal societies have a very different attitude towards the paranormal. Many believe the world of spirits has the same reality as our everyday world, and so parents in these communities are often more willing to talk to their children about ghosts. Perhaps the rest of us can learn something from those societies. I would believe my kids. I, I know that kids have overactive imaginations, but knowing what I know is out there, I wouldn't just ignore it. I, I would do something about it. I would talk to them about it at the very least. And uh, I'm sure that together we could fix it. I have no regrets. Uh, I would not change anything that's happened to me in my past because I think it shaped me into the person that I am today. I mean, it's not the only thing. There's been a lot of other help by a lot of other special people, but um, it's definitely helped, and, and, and I'm glad I'm, I am who I am today. A night that I was closing the restaurant, I propped the door open, saw a very strange light, turned my head, looked down, and saw the image of a little girl whose eyes were absolutely fixed on me and they were the saddest eyes I have ever seen in my life. I looked down and I could see a woman and she looked distraught. She was holding out her hands and saying, my baby, my baby. It's etched in my mind because it was just so overwhelming the feeling that went with it. I know that the Halifax explosion devastated the north end of the city of Halifax. Some buildings were spared miraculously. Our building, the Five Fishermen, was one of them. It has always had a reputation for hauntings, and I had never necessarily put any credence in the stories that I had heard, but uh, definitely since having a couple of experiences myself, I've changed my mind when it comes to what goes on at the Five Fishermen. The Halifax explosion was the biggest disaster in Canada's history. Without any warning, 2,000 people died, more than a quarter of them children. Our experts say ghostly sightings frequently occur where there's been catastrophic loss of life. A lot of confused spirits who don't know they're dead continue to wander. Tragic, especially if they're children. Today, we meet two Halifax women who say they've seen ghosts from the explosion. It's been a heart-rending experience for both of them. The restaurant where Sandra Gardner works was a morgue at the time of the explosion. And years later, one of its deceased occupants starts reaching out to her. Another staff member and I had gone downstairs to check our sister restaurant and as we were performing some cleanup duties, I guess. The inside doors slowly creeped open and then swung back. There was no breeze, there wasn't any reason for that door to have opened. Leonard and I were looking at each other. We saw this together. We were dumbfounded. After the initial shock of actually seeing something like that, it was funny. I guess it was kind of funny. Yeah, we saw that. It can just confirmed for us. It maybe even made us feel better in the end that we weren't 
crazy. And I think that was because there was two of us seeing it together that we felt secure in that. It wasn't more comforting, but it certainly was something that we didn't even try to explain away because we both witnessed it. We knew that it had happened. There was one evening that I was in our private dining room performing some duties. And I had heard my name being called and there was no one in that area of the restaurant. I didn't really give it any kind of credence whatsoever. I just thought I had misheard. Continuing on with my duties, probably five minutes later, my name was called again. At which point I thought, that staff. I went into the area of the restaurant that I thought the voice came from. There was absolutely nobody else in that part of the building but myself. I was definitely alone. Now, the third time I heard my name was a little while later, and I knew I was alone downstairs. I said out loud, that's got to be a fan or a piece of machinery in the kitchen that's on a cycle. And then every time it hits a cycle, it sounds like my name. Those words weren't out of my mouth, and my full name was said, Sandra Lynn. I was scared. I ran. I knew that it was unworldly. one evening that I was in our private dining room performing some duties I had heard my name being called not once not twice but three times now the third time I heard my name my full name was said Sandra Lynn I was scared I ran I knew that it was unworldly it frightened me to the point where I left the building in a hurry. I then felt that, man, did I really hear that? Did that really happen? Come on, Sandy. It's the end of the night. You know, you're tired. It, did that really, really happen? And I have to say it did. The night that... I actually saw something was a night that I was closing the restaurant I was in the office doing up our caches decided that at that time I should go and check our washrooms for faucets running whatnot something we must do every day and prop the door open saw a very strange light turned my head looked down and saw the image of a little girl whose eyes were absolutely fixed on me and they were the saddest eyes I have ever seen in my life. She must have been a little girl of seven, eight, nine. I wasn't frightened for some reason. I held on to the end of the counter and tried to steady myself. I closed my eyes, I opened my eyes, she was there. I closed my eyes, I opened my eyes, she was gone. I stayed in the washroom for probably two or three minutes. I did not run out of the washroom. I, I still can't tell you why I wasn't frightened. And as I was leaving the building that night, I felt horrible for leaving her behind. I wanted to take her home. But I, of course, couldn't. I really felt like that little girl was trapped at the Five Fishermen. It took me a long time to, to actually talk about it because it was sad. 
It wasn't scary. It was sad. It was really sad. I'm going to cry because it was really sad. <laughs> I can't tell you why the little girl would still be lingering in the restaurant other than she isn't able to get to where she's supposed to go. And why she showed herself to me, I have no idea. Because it wasn't like I was truly open to that or looking for that. I mean, maybe her mother had survived the Halifax explosion and the little girl didn't or perhaps i don't know i don't know i know that she was sad and i can only imagine that a little girl of that age is sad because her mom isn't with her to protect her to care for her she's caught between two worlds and it breaks my heart I think about her daily. I wish I knew how she was, who she was, if she's still there. I don't look for her at the Five Fishermen necessarily. I wouldn't be disappointed if I saw her again, but part of me doesn't want to. Part of me does not need to see the sadness in that little girl's eyes again, ever. reaction to the little girl is intense. Our expert Dina Bain-Taylor suggests her maternal instinct likely kicked in. So her ghostly encounter didn't scare her. Instead, it tore at her heartstrings. As a young mother living in the city's north end, the part that was flattened by the explosion, Sandra Church has plenty of maternal instinct herself. And that gives her a special connection to a ghost she sees out her window one night. Well, I uh, first got married in Halifax in 67, and my husband and I moved to a place, uh, an area called the Hydrostone Buildings. And uh, it was built after the Halifax explosion from material that was sent up from Boston. So we moved in, and I had uh, my son. And uh, one day when my son was about Probably coming up a year old, I've uh, experienced uh, seeing this, this apparition. I was upstairs in the front of the house and uh, put my son to bed. I heard a sound outside the window. And it was like a wailing, and I think that the Irish call it keening. It's just a sound that you never hear, usually, except of someone in, in deep sorrow. <laughs> I looked out the window, and as usual, in, in Halifax, there was a thick fog. And uh, I looked down, and I could see a woman, and she looked distraught. It's etched in my mind because it was just so overwhelming the feeling that went with it. It was the early part of December and it was a foggy night, very heavy fog, as is usual in Halifax. And um, I was upstairs in the front of my house and uh, put my son to bed. And I heard a, a wailing, a very high, sad noise. I did think that someone was in trouble out on the, the street or lost or, or been hurt. And uh, I looked down and I could see a woman. And she looked distraught. I guess you could say it looked eerie. It just looked as if it wasn't really happening, but it was. 
I could hear the sadness in her voice, and uh, I could hear her crying, and she was holding out her hands and, and saying, my baby, my baby. And she was looking about, and she was so sad that uh, it just it broke your heart to see how sad she was. And I thought, what is this? Why is she doing that? And slowly it dawned on me that this probably wasn't a, an alive person and that she was certainly injured. And I was, I felt like I was being told something, shown something. She looked to be about 30-ish or younger. She wasn't a teenager. She had bare feet and the dress was torn in places and muddied and uh, her hair was hanging in her face all disheveled and she was wet as if she'd been in a rain or a snowstorm. It felt to me like there was, this was unfinished business for her. Something had happened and she needed to find her baby. I don't think anybody could have alleviated her suffering. I, I think her pain was in her time and no one could have made her uh, feel better or anything like that. And uh, then the fog rolled in again, and she just disappeared. And there was a feeling of sadness in the air. I, was, I thought about my son, and I thought, oh my heavens, what, what a sad thing to lose your baby. I think that her hair and her clothing being muddied and uh, the, the no shoes on her feet in the winter, to me, was a sort of, uh, she'd been in a disaster. Something very sad had happened to her suddenly. I researched the Halifax explosion a little after living in that area. And uh, what I know is that it happened in 1917. There were two ships, one of them was an ammunition ship, and they hit each other, and it just so happens it was positioned so it just blew the north end of Halifax flat and then did a lot of damage otherwise. It was December 6th, and it was really cold, and I believe there was a big snowstorm that happened right after that, so it was really, it was like hell for them, I think. A lot of people disappeared, of course. People lost their families, uh, wives, their husbands, their children. Children lost their parents. When you start walking around, say, the old graveyards or the old churches, there's always some little reminder of it, so it's, it's part of our history. I was still feeling the sadness. There was a rush of sadness in the air, and, of course, I had a, a baby. My son was just as newborn, more or less, and I thought, oh, that's, to feel the loss of your child like that after a disaster, it must have been really sad. She was so sad and so lost, I, I had a sense that she was, she had unfinished business, and she was still looking, and she didn't know that the explosion had been happening, she just was there still looking. When I went to get my son out of his bed, it just, uh, I felt real concern for him and a, uh, a fear for him in a way, and, and really sad that someone should have to spend their lives or their afterlife wandering looking for their own child. If I got anything out of the encounter, I believe that it, it helped my empathy grow stronger because it was like looking at somebody and seeing through their eyes, feeling their, their pain, I guess, and thinking, oh, I'm blessed I still have my child and there's been no great disaster that I've had to live through. made me feel connected to her having a, a newborn a young baby and someone looking for their child where's my baby was uh, not only felt looked sad but 
there was a wash of sadness through the house, through the window. And I also felt a sense of uh, being a part of something that was very special. I think that things like this go on, but not everybody gets to see it. I think that if we're visited by spirits of people who've gone on, I think that that's why they come back for unfinished business. Might want to take care of somebody or, or make amends in some way. And uh, when I started to look at how things happen and why things happen, I could understand it better and I understood better my, my own reaction. I, I was involved in my life and uh, it was just something that happened. But uh, I don't think it would have stuck with me so long if it hadn't been important. And uh, I've always counted it as a, a blessing for me that I, I could see this happen. I wouldn't like to think that she's spending all this time and maybe longer wandering. I hope that she found her baby or there was something that made her I mean, closure for her and she could travel on to wherever our souls go. Children want comfort and affection. Our experts say if there are ghostly children, they would be no different. Our subjects recognized the spirits they encountered needed solace because of their heartbreaking losses in the Great Explosion. Both women were deeply affected by the experience and as a result found the world was a richer place. Though they weren't able to help the ghosts, perhaps in the end it was the ghosts that helped them. I learned a lot from that experience. I learned empathy. I learned that unseen things can come and go in your life if you don't pay attention. And I guess I learned I had a certain sensitivity to um, things that are going on around me. It certainly made me more, more aware of the things that were around me. Up until then, I may have believed in ghosts, in spirits, but I didn't necessarily believe they were always hanging out at the Five Fishermen. But I do now. But I do now. <laughs>